is your life, Chuck. It is. Uh, now you're going to have to speak up. All right. Okay. Is that better? That's better. All right. <clears throat> what, uh, what day is today? Today is July 12th, 1998, and we're up here at uh, the cabin, and the subject here is Chuck's World War II experience. And what I thought I would do is sort of do it chronologically, taking it from before the war, during the war, and then after you were out of the service. And <clears throat> what, what is it that you're referring to there? I'm referring to my diary. No, but that's not the original. This, this is one that was written over to explain it a little better than just the cryptic remarks made in the diary. And where is the original diary? I think it's in, in the safe at home. Okay, and that's more than one book. Yeah. All right, and what's this other thing you have here then? This is the University of Minnesota book, the graduating class of 1939. Oh, and so are you in that? Yes, I am. So that's the year you graduated? Graduated in 1939. And um, so... In business administration. So that was in the spring of 39? It was in the spring, spring or summer, whatever you call it. And then you went to work? Then I went to work for Brown and Dee. And what job did you have? Salesman. What was your territory? Southern Minnesota. And you were selling what medical supplies? Operating tables sterilizers, operating lights, bandages, whatever. And then you'd been doing that for what, about two years, a little over two years at the time the war began? Just... 39 to 41. It was uh, probably a year and a half. year and a half. Yeah. And uh, do you happen to recall where you were on Pearl Harbor, at the time of Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor, I was in Ellsworth at my folks' home, and I remember Roosevelt's speech. So you heard it on the radio? I heard it on the radio when he said this is a day we'll live in infamy. Did, had you heard about Pearl Harbor before the speech? Um, yes. How, how did you hear about it? On the radio. Oh, okay. Right. Now, um, let's see, were you going out with Bernie then before that? Yes. For how long? Oh, for about four or five months. At the time the war started, did you, had you made any plans to get married? Uh, not particularly. Not, not particularly. Did the matter become urgent? Once you yes, decided, yes, did. <laughs> once you decided to, <laughs> and you joined this. First of all, as I understand it, uh, you decided to enlist. I, when I got my draft notice, I decided to enlist in the Navy Air Force. And uh, and I passed everything except when it came to the question of, do you ever have, do you have any allergies? And I said, well, I get a touch of hay fever in the fall. And he said, we, we'll have to stop right here. Because he said, we can't have runny eyes and nose flying a plane. So you were rejected from the Navy Air Force? For that reason. Not necessarily from the Navy, it's just that you couldn't get into the Air Force. Air, you couldn't fly. Couldn't fly. So you wanted to fly. Right. So what did you do then? So then I went over to the Army Air Force, and I enlisted there. And not enlisted, but applied. And then, then I, uh, when it came to the question of allergies, I told them I didn't have any. So you lied. I lied. And you got into that. I lied. I didn't. I didn't inhale. What month <laughs> was that in '42 that you? joined up? I th think probably in 
February. February 42, and where did you, what was your first place that you went to? First place was Kelly Field. In what state? In, in Texas. You go down by train? San Antonio by train, went down by troop train. Right. And uh, what was the name of, of then, uh, was at that place where you had your first training? Yes. What kind of training was that? It was just basic training for, uh, well, just uh, marching around and marching stuff. and calisthenics and was it discipline. an OCS OCS type training? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So you were you wanted to be an officer? Yes. And you know the reason I did. Your mother at the time said that if she joined, she would be an officer and she'd outrank me. Was that right? Yeah, it was awful. That's right, because she'd be a nurse. She'd be a nurse, and she'd be an officer. See? So I would be down there some buck-ass private or something. And she'd be able to tell you what to she'd do? She'd be able to order me around. How long were you at Kelly Field then? I was at Kelly Field about three months. Then where did you go? Then went to Ballinger, Texas. And For Bal flight training. For flight training and to be, to do what? Be a pilot. <coughs> where were you married? Well, you're going a little ahead. But anyway. Well, then I'm trying to get oriented here. All right. In Ballinger, Texas, I didn't like the uh, hazing that went on. Well, what was the hazing that went on? You'd have to walk at a square square corner, maybe do square corners, and upperclassmen would stop you and, and tell you, you, mister, you know, and do this, do that, walk this way, walk that way. So I just, and then we couldn't get to bed until a quarter to ten at night, and we were up at five in the morning. An upperclassman would come in and haze during the day. So I asked to get out. I wanted to transfer to navigation school because I thought it was more of a mental thing than flying, which is physical, too. So... How did you get out? I asked to get out. And did they transfer you? And I, I was transferred to navigation school at Ellington Field. And Ellington was? In, in outside of Houston, Texas. And uh, is that where you were married then? No. Let's see. Yes, we were married at Ellington Field by Father Sullivan, who was a flight, flight surgeon, not surgeon, but a flight doctor, and you went religious to, man. So <laughs> Bernie came down. <clears throat> yeah, we were going to get married in Ballinger, and we had the bridesmaids and so and so picked out, but then I was transferred to Ellington Field and two guys stood up for us. And who was that? Uh, Johnny Kishore and Jim Carlin. Jim Carlin, you remembered his name. Yeah, Jim Carlin from Ma Minneapolis. And then uh, how long before the wedding had Bernie come down there? One day. One day. So it was true love. Well, I assumed it was. <laughs> but you hadn't seen Bernie since uh, February. But we call it, we did a lot of letter writing and telephone. Hey, Judy. Judy. What? We're trying to do this. Uh, and then where did you go for the honeymoon? We went to the Ben Milam Hotel. And I was off from, for two days. And Bernie got a job? Later on, she moved in with a family, and then she got a job at Jeff Davis Hospital as, for, as a nurse for 35 bucks a month. $35 a month. How much were you making? 75 35 isn't a whole lot of money. It's like a yeah. buck a day. That's right. How can that be? That's the way it was. So This was our most coming out of the Depression. Did you have a uh, leave then on weekends? 
got off on Saturday afternoon until Sunday at 3 o'clock. If, yeah. Unless you had gigs where you had to walk the ramp. Okay. If you were gig for not having your bed made correctly or for uh, not doing square corners and that sort of thing, you could get a gig. So you were probably pretty hepped up by 12 noon on Saturday. Oh, I would say so. <laughs> and then, uh, now as I understand there's a little confusion about how long you were at Ellington and how long you were at Monroe, Louisiana, but but do you know where you got your wings, your navigation wing, and when? I think, I think, and I couldn't be sure of this, but I think I got my wings at Ellington Field. And then you went to Monroe? Then went to Monroe. What was the training at Monroe? Uh, there was some flight training there. But so you in planes and flying around? And yeah. yeah. Just more or less flying around and some star classes and that sort of thing. And now, it's some somewhere in this time frame, uh, well, let's see, Mother, I think, said yesterday that she took typing classes in Monroe, right? Right. So he must have been there for a period of time. He was there for, for, I don't know how many months, but not many months. And uh, then uh, Dick Marshall had a Plymouth car. Or this, or is this later? No, this is later. This is later. Monroe. You're at Monroe, and, okay, hold on a second here. Good check. Oh, good, good. We're good. back on the record. The vodka tonic has been made over there. And <laughs> all right, now. The ice is through clinking. Ice is done, done clinking. Colonel clink. <laughs> all right, so now, now, this is where your diary picks up, is in January of 1940. Three, correct? Right. So you really, I mean, it's been a whole year that the war has been going on and you've been sort of safe at home in the States. Right. And But apparently there's been some accidents at various places where you've been, or is that a little bit later? It's a little later. So now your diary picks up where you're going to Salt Lake City with somebody by the name of Belk. Belk and Blunt. Is Belk, uh, where, where's Belk? Belk was, uh, he was uh, in the Marines first and he transferred to the Air Force. He was from Arkansas and he was just tremendous at drilling and that sort of thing from the Marine training. And later on he was killed in an accident in the States. He was killed in the States? In the States, yeah. What, during training? Or? During training. So it was a what a crash or something? A crash. All right. So Belk didn't make it. He didn't make it out of the states. Then from Salt Lake City, you went to Tucson. Yes. And it looks like you got to Tucson uh, in January fifteenth of forty-three. Uh, approximately. Now, I note in your diary that there's an entry of January tenth. Uh, 43 where you're wishing for a B-17. That's right. Why do you want a B-17? I thought it was easier to fly in because it had such big wings that it would float down instead of falling <laughs> like a B-24. So that was, uh, how, how did you come upon that information? <clears throat> well, because of the information I had on the planes. Did you hear stories about? Oh, did I ever. I suppose you did. <laughs> well, okay. No, the B-24s had a had a airfoil wing that was great for speed and that sort of thing, but it sort of sunk in a hell of a hurry, whereas the B-17s would glide. Glide further if it got hit. Yeah. Much, wasn't much gliding with the 24. Now, at, at Tucson, what was the name of the base there? Davis Mountain Field. And... Uh, you were there only for, looks like, a couple weeks. I was there for a month. Well, 
Almost a month. Well, it says on February 3rd in your diary that you're over to Alamogordo. Well, it was probably a little over three weeks then. All right, so... And we formed our crew there. You formed your crew in Tucson. Right. And is that where you met Dowie? That's where I met Dowie and Holmes and the rest of the crew. And uh, Dowie's the guy that was later killed. He was killed. Yeah. All right. He was our co-pilot. He was a co the original co-pilot. Original co-pilot. And the, the one who took over for him was Rifkin. Right. And your crew then was, uh, Holmes was the pilot, you were the navigator, Dowie was the co-pilot, and do you remember the names of any of the other guys? Uh, Dick Marshall was the bombardier. Then so we had Kettenbach, Campton, Weilbacher, Zirko, White, and Cohen. Right, and there was one of them you can't find now. Well, I can't find anybody except White. Right, well, a lot of them are dead. They're dead. Who's all dead? Well, the ones I know are dead are Camden and... Uh, Holmes? And, well, no. I've, uh, Holmes is dead. And uh, Camden is dead. And let's see... Rifkin is dead. Rifkin is dead. He was the second co-pilot. Dowie's and dead. Dowie's dead, and I don't know what happened to Marshall. I'm still trying to find out if he's still alive. Now, where's White located? White is in uh, Trenton, New Jersey. You, you in contact with him at all? Or? Yeah, we talk to you know, each other on the phone about three times a year. What does he do? Or what did He's he do? He's retired from General Motors. What did he do? Was he? He was a steward or something for General Motors and strong union guy. He was what? What was his position on the plane? Uh, he was the nose gunner. He was up in front. And the armorer. The but armorer nose gunner. So he armored the bombs? He armored the, he was in charge of armoring the bombs. So he had to go back in the bomb bay and do something? And well, he had to see that the bombs were on right and they were fused and that sort of thing. All right, now I'm just going to sort of move ahead here. Uh, it looks like you went to Alamogordo on February 3rd. And what kind of training did you get there? Uh, it was mostly... Uh, Flying, uh, it was night, mostly night flying. Were you flying in B-24s at that time? B-24s. You ha didn't know, did you know for sure that you were going to uh, uh, be in a B-24 at that time? No, we didn't. Did you ever fly in a B-17? Never did. All right, then on uh, March... Third, it says you went to Clovis. Well, we were in uh, Almogordo, and that was a relatively new base, and it was quite uh, primitive, you might say. We lived in tar paper shacks, and the wind blew and blew and blew, and uh, we had a lot of accidents there. A lot of a lot of people were killed. A lot of people were killed who were. A lot of, we lost a lot of crews there because of poor maintenance and running into mountains and that sort of thing. Pretty, pretty much. In fact, they shut down the base. They thought there was sabotage. They shut it down for two, three days. And then they made the uh, crew chief, ground crew chief, fly with the plane. So that he made damn sure the thing was operating correctly. That is correct. And did things shape up after that? Well, we had one night where we couldn't get the wheels down, and the crew chief was along, and we couldn't, and he tried to get him down, the crew chief, and then our engineer tried to get him down, and we were all set to bail out with the exception of Holmes, who was the pilot, and he was going to run the plane out of gas, and then belly land. But he went back and after some time he got the wheels down so we landed. So that was a scare? A little scary, yeah, because you don't like to bail out. Nobody does unless you Now the the plane that you were you were flying was not your permanent plane. Well these are planes that were being maintained all 
is training planes all the time. They were B-24 training planes, which is the same as the regular plane. And then you went to Clovis. And then we were transferred to Clovis, New Mexico for a third phase. Now when you're in, in, uh, in Tucson, where's Bernie? She's in Almogordo. And oh, in, in Tucson. Yeah. In Tucson, she was in Tucson. She came over there. And then did she follow <coughs> over to Alamogordo? And she followed over to Alamogordo. And did she follow over Clovis? And she followed over to Clovis, along with Dowie's wife and and uh, Marshall's wife. So they they, <coughs> they became friends. They became close friends. Right. And um, uh, you're in Clovis for how long? Month. About a month. Mm -hmm. What what training are you getting at Clovis? Well, Clovis was gunnery, again, night flying and navigation, night navigation. It's more of the same. More of the same. And uh, now, <coughs> it looks like uh, something happens on April 1st. I have a note here about Bernie something. What, what, what is it, uh, what's your note on April 1st there? There's another thing. Oh, this must be at Almogordo. But in March, two accidents last night, 23 bailed out all safely, two ships lost, everyone grounded. Now we flew to Fort Smith on Friday night. Fort Smith, Arkansas? Mm hmm. Oh, and that's on April 1st? That was on March 21st. All right. Uh, was that, I'm trying to think here. Uh, if, if we're getting ahead of ourselves, ourselves here. This is still Almogordo. Anyway, uh, well, you're in Clovis on March 3rd. On March 3rd? Yeah, you go back and you'll see you went to Clovis on March 3rd. Okay, well then on March 3rd. Five killed in the crash in the field and so on and so on. And then two planes lost. Some they bailed out, guys bailed out except for one. And then uh, at Clovis, we were we were confined to the base except for Saturday. Saturday, and we had to be back at six o'clock on Sunday. And so every once in a while. Uh, we would sneak out of the base because Marshall had a car and he had a pass from some sergeant and so uh, Dowie and I would, he, it was a coupe, Dowie and I would get in the back end and he'd close down the top of it, close down the back of the coupe and he and Dowie and I would be in there until about four miles down the road, and then we'd get out and get in the car <laughs> and go into town. So you snuck off the base? Snuck off the base. You never got caught? Never got caught. And then in the morning, going back, we had to do the reverse. Did you link up with Bernie then? Sure. Oh. She was living in town. Oh, okay. So that must have been kind of a Two small guys, huh? Well, I suppose we were all kind of thin. Nobody was yeah. husky at that time. All right, so then you're at Clovis, and uh, you go to, according to my notes here, you're going to Kansas City on April 5th. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, apparently on April 1st, uh, Bernie leaves to go back to Minnesota. Right. And <coughs> and you go to Kansas City, what, on a train? I think, uh, yes. 
and then uh, you go on to Ellsworth on April 6th. On the train. On the train to Ellsworth? Mm. A Sibley. To Sibley, Iowa, and your mother and father pick you up there. Yeah, and Rena. Rena drove the car. Rena. Rena. Fitzgerald? Rena Meester, who was, who was Dan's sister. Dan McCarran's sister, okay. Rena. And your, your father was elderly at that time? Yes. But he was quite old. Yes. And uh, you hadn't seen them in some time, I take it. That's right. And your mother was there, and how about Toots? Or she was off with uh, Clifford, or? I think she was in Panama. Panama with Clifford. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you stay there for a day or two with your mother and father. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Bernie is still at Minneapolis. I don't know. Well, uh, according to the, your diary there, you go to Minneapolis on April 8th of 1943. Mm, all right. Left for Minneapolis. April 8th. Mm -hmm. Is that on a train? Uh, no, I had the car was down there. So you drove a car? I had a, I had a relatively new Ford at that time. And you drove your car to Minneapolis? Minneapolis, yeah. And then you left the car with Bernie? Yes. Well, okay. we drove back. Did you you drive back to Ellsworth with me? Do you? Know? All right, and so then you have, and then you know. Do you know at this time whether you're going east or west? Didn't know. Still didn't know. And your you know your orders are to report to Topeka, Kansas. Right. And you leave there. You leave Minneapolis, and you get to Topeka on April thirteenth. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And <coughs> is it at Topeka you learn that you're going to the Pacific? At Topeka, we found out that we were headed to the Pacific. But you felt you were getting jabbed, you were mad because you ended up with a B-24. Would, would have preferred to have been in 17s, but it worked out real well. <laughs> well, you did all right. Yeah, I'm back. You know, a lot of those guys that went over to Europe, got on those gigano raids and you know, in the in the thousand plane raids and the five hundred plane raids. Yeah, the Ploesti and yeah. So one of my some of my friends were in Ploesti. Is that right? Right. I mean, what you went through training with? Yeah. So your uh, Bob Felber was in Ploesti. He was a great, good friend of mine. And what happened from Minneapolis? He he made he made, he made it. You made it. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, there's a note I wanted to ask you about. April 16th of 43, you're referring to somebody, uh, somebody, some of these flyers got pink ladies. What uh, were pink ladies? Pink ladies were, were planes that were painted that shade because they were going to the desert over to Africa. So they would be stationed in North Africa and North be, Africa. be flying from there? On to the mainland, I guess. And that those people, uh, for example, were the ones that went to Ploesti. They flew from Africa up to Romania. Some or, of them. Yeah. Some of them. Now, some of them were, went to Italy, to, flew into Italy. This is in Topeka where you had your, your the plane that you ultimately flew in was given to you then at Topeka. That's correct. And how, uh, what was the name of the plane? The plane was named the Blessed Event. How did that get picked? Because Bernie and Evelyn Dowie were both going to have babies and uh, the crew voted on it. That they would call the plane the Blessed Event and we had a picture of a baby holding a diaper in which there was a bomb. And that was on the front of your plane? And that was on the side of the plane, near the front. Near the front. And then do you have a picture of that somewhere? Yes. You know, by the way, they have a book out uh, that has what they call nose art. Nose. Oh, yeah. And uh, you should submit that to them. Because then they would put it in the next edition. I see. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's just you know, it's sort of a mild name 
because so many of the others had famous gals on there and well they had uh, you know big breasts and all that sort of thing yeah well they had this a lot one was sort of team and uh, I think Holmes was uh, he'd like to add a name it was a little more raucous than that a little more pizzazz yeah well apparently it worked out for you so. yeah well, anyhow, uh, then on April 22nd, it looks like you uh, went to Hamilton Field. Mm -hmm. And where was that? Hamilton Field was San Francisco. And it was extremely well camouflaged base. We were, we flew in there and it was, we hardly knew we were over the field. It was so well camouflaged. Yeah, somebody had the radio to you, and we 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 thought this is where we should be, and then as we circled down, we could s see some things. It was extremely well camouflaged. That later became another name renamed Travis Air Force Base, uh, named after General Travis. Yeah, uh, you st apparently stopped off in Salt Lake City on the way to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. What was the reason for that stop? Did they do some work on the plane, or? I think that. Or did you get orders, or? Well, I don't know if that's out of context. We stopped in Salt Lake City uh, to refuel, I think. And then you just went on to Hamilton. Yeah. Then, uh, moving on to phase two here. It looks like on April 28th of 1943, you left for Hawaii. That is correct. And that was a fairly long trip. That was a 14 hour and 10 minute trip. And we had extra Bombay gas tanks put in, and we flew alone. And why did you fly alone? We flew alone because that was the way we were scheduled to fly. There was a plane left about every 30 minutes alone and uh, was there radio silence there was radio silence all the way and how did you navigate navigated by dead reckoning to begin with until after I think we we're out three hours or better and, and then I was able to take some celestial fixes and we were 50 miles left of course and so I told the pilot to change drew a line from there into Hawaii and told him to change to whatever degrees it was so it would head right into Hawaii and later on the wind blew us over to the right of course and at that time we drew a line in I drew a line in and we came right in did you, uh, uh, how often was it that you checked, did, did the check? Celestial checks, oh, nearly every, nearly every hour. How long would it take you to do one? It would take probably 10 minutes. What specifically were you checking? We were checking the, use the stars to get a, get the azimuth of the stars and then where they cross that is where you are after you move up the lines for the speed of the plane which was going about 170 miles an hour. And uh, did you have books and things that you referred to? Oh yes. And did you have instruments that you used? I had a sextant and a bubble, arc, bubble to shoot the stars. You had, so you, there was a space over your head where where there was a plastic plastic and 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 that would I could see the stars through that and, and it was in the nose of the plane how 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 did clouds then interfere with your ability to navigate well if we were in the clouds you couldn't see the stars so then you were useless well except for Ed Reckoning flew so far in this direction for so long and this is where you're supposed to be. Then 
Uh, and on the way over, apparently, you saw something in the water. Uh, the plane that took up off about 30 minutes ahead of us, evidently, uh, we saw this light and looked like flames in the water. And uh, it was at the point of no return, which is halfway. And we assumed something was wrong, but we couldn't report it because of silence. Were you instructed, even if you saw something, to not report? Yes. Did you suspect at that time that the plane in front of you was down? Or did we you didn't know? know? We didn't actually know what it was, but it was strange to see this lights, light and fire out there in the middle of the ocean. We were, flew over at 8,000 feet, which isn't too high. But uh, You think they heard you down there, if there was anybody alive? No. That's over a mile. And what, nobody could do anything. That's just like looking for a needle in a haystack. You know, ocean is, there's 2,400 miles over there, and this was at about the 1,200 mile spot. Uh, so you just, did you personally see the fire in the water? Oh, yes. Okay. You got a what? Most of the crew slept, except for the pilot, navigator, Myself, Pi but pilot, and nav co-pilot, and navigator. Everybody else is sleeping. Yeah, all kind of slept. Yeah. So, uh, did you have an intercom then that you could use inside the plane? Oh yes. And then did you? I suppose you use that. Huh? Yeah. Were you on oxygen? No, we weren't that high. Uh, you ultimately came into Hawaii. Did you have any difficulty? We did because we were supposed to circle. I think it was an hour outside of Oahu. And uh, it was a question of whether it was circle right or circle left. And anyway, uh, we circled, and pretty soon there were fighter planes that met us coming in. And we followed them into Hickam Field. So they came out to make sure who it was? Who it was, yeah. And uh, was there a visual identification? Well, were you were you able to break radio silence when you got there? I can't answer that. And was it daylight when you got there? It was daylight. But you had flown through the night. All night. Uh, and when was it that you learned that the, what you saw in the water actually was the crew in front of you? Well, because the crew in front of us didn't come. So you heard that after and we you reported went. that course when we got to Hawaii and we saw this and that was crew I knew the navigator named Samick from Minneapolis and they were missing they never found them never found them. then uh, I suppose you have no idea what was the cause of the crash no. um, okay <coughs> now see on uh, uh, I'm just looking at some of the notes here on May 10th uh, it says you lost eight dollars playing blackjack May 10th hmm? was that was that something you did you played cards a lot over there let's see uh, well when we got to Hickam Field, the we were getting a nose turret put in the plane, and that took 12 days. <coughs> and so the officers were allowed to stay in town, which we did. We went into town and stayed at the Willard Inn, which was right on, virtually on the beach. And there, at that time, there were only two hotels in Hawaii, on the beach. The Royal Hawaiian and the Moana. And uh, there was barbed wire all up and down the beach to protection against invasion and that sort of thing. Just like from here to eternity? Probably. Just like the movie? I never saw it. Didn't you ever see that movie? No. With Burt Lancaster and Frank no. Sinatra. And no. Well, that's a good movie. You should see it. 
Uh, but in any event, you played some cards there. Yeah, we played cards. Sort of a pastime. And we, I have some menus from the town, from Hawaii. What was it? What's the town? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Honolulu. Honolulu, yeah. Yeah. And you apparently visited Pearl Harbor when you were there. Yes, we visited Pearl Harbor and saw this Arizona where there was where it was sunk and there was some other ship there too. And we uh, actually went on a submarine to oh, you did? look at it. Oh, look. really? Yeah. You could see, I mean, Maybe. some sort of a sub, I mean, you could look out windows and see it? Well, we mostly from the top. top you know. I see, okay. Then you left Pearl Harbor on May 14th. Let's see here. All oh, this evening we leave for Canton Island. And how long was that flight? That was the island is three miles wide and seven miles long. It's very small, out in the middle of the Pacific. And, uh, and then I have in my notes here that this is the island that Rickenbacker's navigator missed. In flying to an island like that that's so isolated, you fly to the side and then take a line of position from the sun into the island. And he evidently flew to the, he was to the left of the island and then flew, flew to the left and ran out of gas. Never made the correction. Never made the correction. No. What happened to him? They were in a, they were in a boat for lifeboat for 17 days and some of them died but Rickenbacker survived and Rickenbacker was a hero of World War One. Interesting story. Mm -hmm. So you were at Canton Island for a couple of days and then went to... That was a 10 hour 10 minute flight which is... It's a long haul. It's a long haul. It was damn it was around 2,000 miles. So you're really, you're a long ways from home now. We're a long ways from home and it was a long flight to hit this little tiny island. There's nothing out there. And not much happening in Cantana, Canton well, Island. Well, it was really, really a sad sack. They had some uh, fighter pilots that would fly out once in a while to observe things. And they said that they could only keep them there for about three months because they grew stir crazy. Because there was nothing there. It was just a, a island of coral and sleeping quarters were underground with a top over it of some kind, but there was nothing up. And uh, so they had to ch transfer those guys out of there. We were there, I think, two or three days. Well, you were there two days because on the 16th, uh, May 16th, you went to Nandi in the Fiji Islands. Oh, yeah. And uh, at Nandi, it looks like you left. Let's see, maybe you left or you got to Nandi on the 18th. Is that right? Well, we passed the, probably passed the international mm -hmm. dateline. Dateline, yeah. And you went to Plains de Gaillac. Plains de Gaix in New Caledonia. And that was... The name of the Air Force Base there was what? Uh, Tantuta. Tantuta Air Force Base in Plains de Gaix, New Caledonia. And was there a city nearby there? Uh, yes. What was the name of that city? What was it? Do I have it down here, Charlie? You do. Nomea? Numea, yeah, you know, Numea is the name of the town. And did you go there? We went there. There was, it was a French-speaking island. French-speaking island. And the people were, what, Javanese? Javanese. What were they like? Well, they were little tiny people. Were they, were they, what, dark color? Or they were sort of dark. Were they Polynesian? More of the Polynesian type, yeah. They, they, <coughs> Yes, they were. And you were there for a while. We were there for a while. 
And I just, a couple of notes I have here is that it's uh, on uh, here in New Caledonia where you went to see Artie Shaw and you got onto the Saratoga. Is that right? Uh, yes. And uh, so this is, it looks like on the, tw uh, you got onto the Saratoga on May 26th. I think that's right. And who was the, the pilot that invited you on to the ship? There was a Navy pilot named Kramer. And what happened to him? Uh, Cra Kramer later was killed in the Battle of Coral Sea. And the Battle of Coral Sea was very... Well, it was, it was coming up then, the battle. It was in the, not much farther in the future. Really. Well, it was right before the Battle of Midway. It was after the Battle of Midway. Actually, I think it was right before the Battle of Midway. I could be wrong about Do that. Do you? Yeah, because I think that the Lexington, if I recall correctly, or was the Lexington or the Yorktown, was was damaged at Coral Sea, and they miraculously repaired it in three days or something so that it fought at Midway. Oh, I, might, I right? may be wrong I about that. I think you're wrong. But yeah. anyway, history will bear it out. Well, whatever is right is right. Yeah. Anyhow, Kramer got killed at Coral Sea. Yes. And, uh... <clears throat> Wait, do you want me to tell about uh, being on board the Saratoga? Yeah, you need to tell me about that. All right. We were in town and we were talking to Kramer. We were having a drink in this little bar. And he invited us on board the uh, Saratoga, which was a large aircraft carrier at that time. It had 2,400 men. And uh, we were, he said, you guys think you're the cream of the crop, the Air Force, and come and see how the real people live. So he said, come on out tomorrow night and for dinner. And so uh, I was with Dowie and Camden, and Camden was enlisted. So I put on some second lieutenant bars on him. And so the three of us went out for dinner on board the Saratoga. And they had uh, waiters and napkins and steak and napkin rings. And, and the food was just excellent. And then we went on deck and they had a movie. This is all the, the ship was stationed there for that time in Numea. And uh, the captain came in and everybody stood up and when he sat down the show started and we saw the movie Mrs. Miniver. And it was quite a treat to see the protocol that went on in Navy. News. And uh, what do you know what happened to the Saratoga? Saratoga was badly damaged in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Was it sunk? No, it wasn't sunk, but it had to go back to the U.S. I think for repair. And uh, what kind of plane was it that Kramer flew, do you know? He flew a torpedo dive bomber, which flew at about 12,000 foot altitude and then dipped down, almost straight down, and then leveled off and dropped a torpedo so it would float in, in the water towards the ships that they were trying to sink, a ship trying to sink. And Dowie went up for a flight with Kramer. And he said almost pulled his damn insides out because of the G's. I mean, when, so when they went down and then had to level pull up? Pull out, you know, he just basically down dragged out with eyeballs that almost sunk out. Then I, uh, noting in your diary about the 29th and 30th of, uh, of May, uh, 43, you're starting to wonder about Bernie and what's happening and you know that she's due and mm -hmm. maybe you can take a look at those no notes, but it looked to me like you, on the 30th, you were speculating that she was in the hospital and or had had the child. And who we later found out was Nancy. Right? 
Wasn't that Nancy that you had the first one? <laughs> right, Mother? No. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to be too loud. I don't want to get on your talking machine. Now. Why don't you want to get on? You can get on the talking machine. You can, if you want to add something in. Now, when is it? What time? Are May 30th. May the birthday. May. And it's your one year anniversary. Let's see now. May 30th. Yeah. It, maybe if you didn't close the book every time, you wouldn't have to open it up all the time. <laughs> I got my first letter from Bernie on May 11th. And then what? Where, what? What number are we? Seeing? May 30th. Go to May 30th. Marshall and I went to the river and washed our clothes. Everything was dirty from the mud and the rain. I must check the octant before then. Tomorrow we'll go to... Went to Mass today and so on. Since uh, May 30th, we had, let's see. So Bernie probably has the baby by now. She's most likely in the hospital at our, on our anniversary. Shame I can't be with her. And that turned out to be true. Right. Because it was on May 30th that Nancy was born. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of a... Prophetic. Prophetic. And then on June 2nd, you leave Tantuda to Espiritu Santo. Mm -hmm. Now that's in the, the uh, what islands? The Solomons? No, it's, it's in the New Hebrides. The New Hebrides. The New Hebrides. The Hebrides Islands are in off of the coast of Scotland, and this is called the New Hebrides Islands. And Guadalcanal was also one of the New Hebrides? No, Guadalcanal was in the Solomon group, Solomon Island group. All right, and what's the distance from Espiritu Santo to Guadalcanal? Oh, I think it was probably 600, 700 miles. So you go from Espiritu Santo to Guadalcanal on June 4th. Yeah. And what field do you land at? I think we landed at uh, Kearney Field. And where were you stationed there? At Kearney or Henderson? We were stationed at Kearney, but because of work on Kearney going on at the time, we flew out of Henderson for a few missions, which was a Navy field. And your first mission was on June 12th. Yeah. Right. Yes, it was. And where did you go? We went to Kihili, which was a big Jap air aerodrome. Where was that? That was on the island of Bougainville. And how far away was that from Guadalcanal? That was probably uh, see, close to 500 miles. So it's a thousand mile round trip. Right. And you were day or night bombing? We were night bombing. Uh, how were you able to get a fix on, uh, on where you were going if you couldn't see? It wasn't always cloudy. We, we got to use the stars. Well, but I mean, how did you know where the airfield was if you couldn't see it? That's what I'm saying. Well, it was plotted out on our line, and usually, and well, the searchlights would come up, and the ACAC would start firing the line. So you just sort of bombed where you thought the field might well, be? Well, this is where we should be, and uh, we could you can see where the searchlights were coming up. That must be the air base. 
So you bombed at the searchlights. At night, yeah. All right. Uh, then it looks like the Japanese were raiding your place too. They were. They they'd come down and uh, raid us too. And that caused you some concern, I suppose. Well, sometimes we couldn't land because they were raiding. And then on <coughs> I'm just going to name off some of the other places here that uh, you apparently bombed. Nauru. What's Nauru? Nauru was a an island that had a lot of guano on it. It was a very rich island. Even today, it's a rich island. And it was only about three miles in diameter. And uh, th that was a Jap base there. And so uh, we were scheduled to bomb Nauru, our, our squadron. And we got out to the field at 7.30 in the evening. And there was an air raid, so we had to get out of the plane. And then later on, they figured we had too much gas, so uh, the plane was too heavy to take off. So every plane had to drain out 400 gallons of gas on the ground. And we did that, and then we waited for it to sort of dry or whatever it does. And we were scheduled to take off individually. And running, going down the runway, we had a flat tire, so we did not fly on that. You didn't fly mm -hmm. on that uh, <coughs> attack on Nauru? No. And another place you went to was uh, Balali. Balali was was up near Kahili. Balali was another Jap aerodrome on there. On, on Bougainville? It was near Bougainville. The island of Balali was near Bougainville, and there were both Jap air bases. Uh, I, I want to ask you in particular about uh, when it was that you heard uh, about Nancy. There's a note in your diary there. What, what heard day? about Nancy on July 3rd. How did you hear about that? Got a letter. Got an a email, not an email, but a, some kind B of a mail. BJ, BJ mail. B, B letter? B email or VJ? B email that said to report this is from the service. That your wife wants you to know that she had a baby girl, Nancy, born on May 30th. Okay. So you, uh, that's the first you heard? First. And I suppose you were relieved? I was relieved, and we all. Everybody was anticipating this in the crew, and so we managed to have a little celebration. And Holmes got sick; he drank a few too many. We just had water, you know, for <laughs> with a little bit of whiskey we had, and it was hot and so on. And so on. anyway, we so had a little celebration. But Dowie, Dowie's wife hadn't had her child yet. No, she hadn't. Yeah. But well, we're going to have to hold here while the tinkling goes on here. See that again? Uh, I'll bring that in now. Yeah, go ahead. Just for information, uh, Yamamoto was commander of the, of the Pacific Fleet, was flying into Bougainville to uh, Kahili Airport. And the Americans had broken the Japanese code, and they knew he was coming. And so they sent up P-38s from Guadalcanal, and they caught him and shot his plane down, and it crashed in Bougainville. And that was a great loss to the Japanese because he was a top guy in the Japanese. Yeah, he was a great tactician. Great tactician. And he was educated in the United States, and uh, yeah. considered to be a great loss to the Japs. And incidentally, the Japanese never cracked our code because it was in Navajo. That's right. It was in Navajo, Navajo language. The Navajo, Navajo language. Yeah. Now was uh, now they shot down Yamamoto shortly before you got to Guadalcanal. About a week. 
You were in apparently New Caledonia at the time that occurred. Either there or Espirito Santo, the Espiritu Santo. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me get a bit back to this Dowie situation. At the time you heard about Nancy, he hadn't heard about whether his wife had had the child. So that's correct. So yours was the first of the two to that you got news about. Right. And it was shortly after that, on July 6th, that Dowie uh, unfortunately volunteered to take Rifkin's place on another crew. Tell that, me how that, tell us about how that, what came about. That was about. unusual because Hathaway's co-pilot was grounded for illness. And that was... And who was that? That was Rifkin. That was Rifkin. You didn't know Rifkin at the time. I didn't know him at all. Okay. And so. Hath and Hathaway was the pilot of that B twenty four. Yeah, Hathaway was, and he was going to his wife was going to have a child too. And he was killed over there. He and the crew were killed a little later. Nice person. And uh, anyway, uh, Dowie hadn't flown before that. And so he wanted to, he was gung-ho and he got, there, they had to sign somebody else to take Rifkin's place. Well, if you'd already had your first mission, why hadn't Dowie flown? They just flew the pilot and the navigator on these training, these two missions to learn how, how the thing went whatever you call it. And uh, then after the, those two missions, then you were supposed to fly your own plane. So Dow, Dowie volunteered? Dowie volunteered and got Rifkin's replacement taken off and flew in his place. And what did Dowie tell you before he left? He said, maybe I'm crazy for doing this, and then as he was leaving, he handed me his wallet, and he said, in case I don't come back, give it, send this wallet to Evelyn. And he says, what am I doing? He said, what am I saying this for? And then he went out, and he never did come back. And uh, how did you find out about it? His plane didn't come back. Oh, were you... Well, we waited up till three in the morning, and uh, there was no word. And uh, then, of course, the following day, they sent out searches, which they did for planes. Never found anything, and so they, the whole crew, of course, was missing in action, and he was among them. Oh, he was a good friend of yours, I take it. Very good friend. Was he? Would he? Would you consider him your best friend then, over there at the time? I would say so. At that time. At that time, because we both had the same problems, you might say. Both our wives were pregnant, and they had lived together, and we had lived together, and we got real close. He was from Des Moines, and I was from Minneapolis. And uh, you. Uh, uh, I suppose you held out some hope for a period of time that maybe he'd be found. Not very long. Because they usually, that was it. The ocean is so damn big. Where was the raid too that he got lost on? Kahili. He went to Kahili and it was a night mission? Night mission. <coughs> and, uh, then I, I, a couple of other things that happened were that uh, you note here that Price's crew uh, didn't come back on July 10th. Who was Price? Price was another uh, pilot, and did you know him? Knew him and his crew. We were all sort of lived together. What were your living conditions over there? We lived in tents with mosquito netting and a, and a wood floor. How close were you to the field? Oh, probably 
four miles. Four miles? Mm -hmm. So how did you get to and from the field? In trucks. The truck would come up and take a crew and we'd sit on the back end. In the back end on think boards along the sides. And uh, there's reference to San Isabel Island on the 12th. What's San Isabel? San Isabel was a uh, Jap held island. And did somebody get found or there? On the 12th of what? July 12th. July 12th. See if you can find that reference there. It might mention here that on, on July uh, 7th, Hathaway's and Little Page's crews are lost. That's another. Hathaway was the crew that Rifkin was on. Well, that was Little. Dowie's crew. Yeah. The one That's that one Dowie. That Dowie yeah. And then Little Page was a, a West Point graduate, and I flew with him one time. And he went, they never came back. And then uh, Price's crew on the 10th? Price's crew on the 10th. Mm -hmm. The weather must have been his nemesis. The weather was, was a bad factor there because it was, it was so, it was, Lousy weather a lot of the time, and big thunder clouds, and lightning, and so on. It, it was really tough. And then another thing on the eighth, uh, Cobb's crew went down, and I was a friend, a good friend of Calvin Brown, a navigator, and he was killed because they had to belly land and uh, he was in front of the ball turret. And when they landed, the ball turret came forward and crushed him to death. And they, the rest of the crew floated into the life rafts that they had. Nine of them were sort of saved. They were up near San Isabel. Yeah. And uh, so he was the only, the navigator. Navigator was killed. He was the only one killed. Yeah. Then Rifkin joined your crew on the 13th of July. Evidently. Uh, and your, let's see, your bomb group was what, what bomb group? Well, we were in three bomb groups. No. We were three, three squadrons. squadrons. Three squadrons. We were in the 424th, the 371st, and the 372nd. Squadron. Squadrons. And your bomb group was what? 307th bomb group. How many squadrons in a bomb group? I think there are three squadrons. And uh, the how many planes in a squadron? Uh, Twelve. And so, uh, were you all housed at the same area? Did you all have your tents at the same place? We had our, there was, surprisingly, we had what's called officer's country, and uh, there were, uh, so many officers to a tent. I think there were four. Sometimes we had six in our tent. Uh, and the only difference was a rope between officers' country and enlisted men's country. And hence, they were housed six or eight to a tent. And uh, one time, uh, Holmes had to go over and quiet them down because they were people were complaining that they were arguing and arguing about which car was the better, the Plymouth or the Ford, and shouting at each other about <laughs> that minor things. And then one of the uh, guys was Wildbacher and he was a gun crazy guy. And he shot a hole in the floor by mistake, pumping up his right his his forty five. And he was, they were all the crewmen. They were the crewmen. They were the six <coughs> enlisted men. Now, <coughs> just going through this, uh, 
It looks like on uh, the 19th, July 19th, Ward's crew was shot down. On the 25th, Lieutenant Wise's crew was shot. On the 27th, Apple's crew was killed at uh, at Buttons, you called it. Uh, so well, there were some crews being shot down. There was attrition. And were these uh, all single plane raids? Is the well, they no. The, they were single plane raids. They were single plane raids with the ex exception of Apple's crew, which crashed on takeoff. And uh, that's where, where who, who was it was killed? He was Sutton. Sutton, yeah. George Sutton yeah. was a navigator, and the whole crew was killed. They, they crashed on takeoff and burned. Then they didn't figure out what happened? Never heard. Now, you uh, uh, have a couple of names in there, buttons. What did that refer to? Buttons was the code name for Espiritu Santo, and Cactus was the code name for Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. <coughs> um, <laughs> it looks like on the 25th you had a raid on Munda. Munda was a Jap air base too. Where was it? It was the island of Munda. Was it close to Bougainville or? No, it was closer to uh, Guadalcanal and Bougainville. You bombed that more than once? I think we bombed it a couple of times. It was not a very long raid like Kahili was. It was probably uh, three hours back and forth. You, you knew Sutton, apparently? Yes. How did you know him? I knew him from navigation and also from uh, meeting and we were in, on buttons there for some time together. Being from Minneapolis, we were, had things in common. He was just, he was one hell of a nice boy. And he was a navigator? He was a navigator. Then there's a reference here, I'm sort of skipping around here, but uh, on August 11th there's reference to something called the Clover Club. What was that? Well, that may, may have been the little officer's club that they built that had uh, mosquito netting and we could get beer there. And uh, sometimes some of the Marines would come over, Marine fighters, that's where I met Joe Foss. They'd come over and swig beer with us and we'd shoot dice and play cards and that sort of thing, play poker. And you apparently learned at some time when you were on Guadalcanal that George Robinson was also there. Got a letter from Bernie. Said he was there. He was in the Third Marine Division, and that was like being in South Dakota or whatever. You know, it just didn't. We just didn't travel around that much on that island. You apparently tried to make contact with him, but he had already gone up to. Uh, I think he went up to Empress Augusta Bay or something. Then you did a, a lone mission to Balali on August 13th. Mm -hmm. And uh, some Zero was shooting at you there. Zeros would come in with headlights on and, and, and of course they all had tracers. In case you just light up the sky with tracer bullets. And the plane ahead of us was shot down scared the hell out of us because there they were going down you could see the flames and then when he got in the water it just the flame just sort of billowed up and so that was one of the big scares that we had. And then apparently when you got back you found out you had some holes in the plane somewhere. Yeah, we had planes, we had holes in the plane someplace. Somewhere, somewhere around the waste gunners and in the, in the tail and so on. Now, uh, then uh, on August 16th it looks like you went to, is there a place called Buka or Bula? Or? Buka is another island above above uh, Bougainville. 
and there was a Jap air base there. And uh, we were sent up to Buka, Buka, a night mission. We were picked to go up there and orbit over the uh, air base while the B-25s, we were, what would you call it? Decoy. Do decoys and the, for the uh, B-25s, a group of them came in in formation and bombed the island at treetop level. And we were up about 20,000 feet. And we orbited around and dropped some bombs and the searchlights were up on us. And then uh, we could see the B-25s come in because of the flashes and so on down below. And so we got out of there then and the tail gunner thought he saw a uh, zero following us. And so Holmes did a lot of diving and swerving around. And it wasn't a zero, it was a planet. The planet was below us a ways. And it looked like a plane coming in with searchlights on it. So we were relieved. And then uh, on the 23rd, uh, some of the people from your squadron, the 424th, were sent home. Yeah, they had so many missions or something. And they, you were ticked off because you thought you had gone through just as much as them. Well, that's right. And they, they didn't have any, they took off any uh, sort of policy for the number of missions, and they like like the psychiatrist down in New Zealand said they they flew you until you wore out, and it was like a rubber band stretched too much. When 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 you started, was there a certain number of missions you were expected to go? Well, we were thinking it was twenty five, and that was in our own minds, but it turned out that didn't work that way. And uh, there was apparently some kind of a point system. But even that really wasn't a hard and fast rule. No, it wasn't. And then you got uh, switched to the 371st Squadron, and then two days later over to the 372nd Squadron. Yeah. See, there were attrition in these various squadrons, and I think that's why we were moved to fill in, fill in, fill in. And then uh, on the 30th, it says Lieutenant McDonald's plane was lost. Did you know him? Knew him, yeah. And what, where was he lost? In the same. Kahili type raid? Kahili or? raid, yeah. That raid, uh, by the way, backing up the raid to Buka, that was further than Kahili. That was further than Kahili. Yeah. So that would be the longest you flew, or? That was about, yeah, that was the longest we flew. So that would be more than, more than the 500 miles one way. Oh, yes. So, then, uh, moving ahead here, it looks like on uh, September 16th, there's something about the ball turret dropped out somewhere. Well, we were flying over uh, Kahili and uh, Akak -Ak hit this one plane and the ball turret was suspended. It was, it was flopping down like this, you know, and you flew over the target. They'd let the ball turret down with the gunner in and, and the so we could shoot. And it, it wasn't down all the time because of repair resistance. And uh, this hit the ball turret, the structure of the ball turret, and the guy was in there and just fell, the ball turret fell out onto the airfield, onto the Jap airfield with the guy in there. It was really a sad deal. Fell on Kahili. Fell on Kahili. Um, then I'm moving ahead here. It looks like on the 23rd of September of 1943, you went to Auckland, New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And what was that for? That was called, oh, that was r and &R, Rest and Rehab, re Restoration and Rehabilitation. Uh, how, did, how did you like Auckland? Loved it. Did you ever want to go back there? I did, yeah. So why don't we go back there? Well, I don't know if your mother can hack the ride. 
It's a long haul. It is a long haul. It's 13, 14 hours. It'd be a nice, nice place to visit though, wouldn't it? Oh, it's a lovely place. What if I figured it out where you could go to Canton Island? And you wouldn't go to Canton. You'd go to Hawaii and fly from there. No, but I mean, if you could go to Canton and then you could go to uh, Rindy or Bindi and then go to New Caledonia, Noumea, and then you could go to Guadalcanal, and then you could go to Auckland, and, and all those places that you just love. Well, I, I don't know if I have the interest. I like I like New Zealand because it's civilized. Did you ever get stationed at any place over there other than Guadalcanal? No. So you well, never we were on station for short term, you know. Like you never went out and flew out of Bougainville. Though. Never flew out of Bougainville. Because they hadn't taken it by the time you well, left. Well, they hadn't. No. And then you made first lieutenant on September 22nd. Evidently. Okay. And uh, you're back to Guadalcanal on October 9th. Mm -hmm. And some of the people, when you went to Auckland, when you went to Auckland, one of the guys got to go back. Who was that? Rifkin. He got to go back. Oh, oh no! I excuse me. That was Marshall, the bombardier. He was uh, he was terribly nervous and shaky, and they sent him home. He's the guy you've lost track of now. Yes. He yeah. was a friend of ours, the mother and mother, he and his wife. And you don't know what happened to him then. Never did. I wrote in one time about ten years ago, and they said that. There were records that were destroyed someplace down in St. Louis. And uh, then I talked to uh, White, and he tried to locate him up in New York, and he couldn't. And so uh, just recently, just within the past two weeks, I wrote to the Cena Marsh, who was sort of the person who was in charge of the 307 Farm Group reunions. And they'll probably print it in a magazine, or maybe some of them will know about it. Uh, I've tried and can't reach him. I, he was kind of a heavy smoker, so he may be dead. I mean. He could be. Yeah. yeah, he got cancer or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then I there's a note here on your diary of October 25th to 43 uh, that uh, <coughs> the first mission back after you got back to Guadalcanal and there was a crew that uh, apparently got shot down near Chozil or Chozil? Chozul. Chozul. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> that plane was lost. That plane was lost. They, they, were, they strafed the people, uh, the, the servicemen who jumped out. The Japs strafed them and killed them. And shoots. There was a survivor though. Did I see that? Well, it was Malekas. Oh, Malekas? That's right. He was a survivor and he was in the water for two days and floated into shore. And he was kept on the island by the coast watchers and friendly natives because most of the natives did not like the Japs. Did you know Malekas before that? Yes, we were in the same squadron. Okay. He was from Michigan. And uh, so you were, I take it, uh, he came back then at some later date? Then he came back after, I think it was, almost a month. He came back, uh, the Navy picked him up and brought him back. Uh, and uh, I can tell you about the Coast Watchers at another time. If they were people, I'll make a synopsis of it, they were either French or New Zealanders who were on the island who were put there because they knew the island or had worked for the coconut people and, and they s could send back some sort of radio messages back to Guadalcanal. And they would report that somebody was picked up. So, so you heard that Malekas had been picked up before he actually came back? Actually, we didn't. We thought he was lost with the whole, with his whole crew. 
We thought everybody was lost. So when he came back, I suppose you were happy. We, and we were happy as hell. And he had a you know a beard, and he had uh, kind of sores on his face and that sort of stuff. That was his second rescue, you might say, because in the states he was a sole survivor of a crew of a crash, and over there he was a sole survivor of a crash. So he was a sole survivor of two, two cra crashes. Yeah, two B-24 crashes. Well, I suppose he figured that his time was almost up, huh? They sent him back to the U.S., <clears throat> and he rested up for a while, and then he became an instructor. But he didn't fly any more combat missions after no, that? No, no, he was sent back out of combat. All right, then on November 1st of 43, apparently the Marines uh, were landed at Empress Augusta Bay. That was in Bougainville? Bougainville. George Robinson was on that landing. That was the 3rd Marine Division. Right. And you folks were still bombing Kahili at that time. Yes. And uh, then on the 4th, you bombed Buka again. Mm -hmm. And then you have a note in your diary that on the 12th of November you had 33 combat missions and you were on track to bomb Munda again. Munda? Munda. Hmm. Must have found some Japs there or something. And then uh, the note here on November 30th, your ammo dump exploded or uh, on Guadalcanal. Oh God, I ran exploded for days and days. It was $20 million worth of ammunition went up. And, you know, couldn't do anything because it was just exploding all the time. Uh, and then back, and then in December of 43, you went back to Auckland. Right. And how many combat missions had you done by the time you, you'd gone we had to? 42 missions. And you were in uh, Auckland for a couple of weeks. We were in Auckland. When did we go back to Auckland? Did it, did it say I didn't it? get that figured out. Uh huh. Well, we went back to Auckland, and uh, of course, when we went back to Auckland, everybody had physicals and that sort of thing. And so they were going to uh, the psychiatrists uh, put us all in the hospital or combat fatigue and took us off of flying. Yeah, but I understood that you you didn't at, at least initially qualify for it. I didn't initially qualify and it just about killed me because I would have been the only one to go back. So when you found out they all qualified except for you, what did you do? I smoked cigarettes and got my heart rate up. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went back and did you talk to them and told them that you thought it was a raw deal if they all got to go back? and. Well, I talked to this, I can't remember the major name, and he said, well, I think you're right, it's not fair for you to go back and the rest of the crew to go back to the United States. You should go back as a group. So you got to go back? I, I went back with the rest of them. And where did you leave from? We left from Auckland. On what kind of a ship? On a Liberty ship. And you, how long did the trip take? It took 14 days. And were you just, uh, did you have quarters on the ship? or? Well, we, we had quarters of some kind. You know, those ships were not luxury liners. And it was sort of strange because somebody had a fifth of booze and we were celebrating that we were leaving Auckland. And we woke up in the morning and we found out that we were still in port. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all disappointed. But then it took off about noon the next day. And uh, some they were disab disabled people who were going back. Some of them had psychiatric problems. They washed their hands all the time. Some of them had uh, the disease you get from jungle rot. and It, it, it was quite a thing. And, we didn't stop in Hawaii. We went right straight back to the U.S. But at night, if they thought they heard a Jap submarine, they would stop. And no one could smoke cigarettes after five o'clock at night because they glow in the dark. And then they would stop the ship 
and it shows that the engine wouldn't be going. And uh, then we'd start up again whenever they thought they were, it was safe to start up. So it took us 14 days to get back. Two weeks? That's a long haul. That's a long haul. Yeah, you were going pretty slow then. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you came into what port? Came into San Francisco. And did you go to the hospital there? But then we were transferred to Letterman Hospital in San Francisco. How long were you there? We were there a week, I think. And then where did you go? And then we went to Monroe, Louisiana to another hospital in Monroe. I thought you went to Temple, Texas. Excuse me, Temple, Texas. Where was it that you first met up then with uh, Bernie? Temple, Texas. So she came down on the train? She came down on the train. So it was happy days? Happy days. And uh, did you, uh, uh, did you met, apparently had made telephone or letter contact? Oh, yes. And uh, how long were you in Temple then? I think we were there about a month. And then you went to? Then we transferred to Miami, Florida. And I've seen photographs where you're down there and she's in her swimming suit. Is that where you were at? That's right. So well, now that was in Paso Grill, Florida, which that, is which is near St. Petersburg. So that was before or after that? That was after. Later. Went to Miami, and because Nancy was there, we couldn't stay in the big hotels because they were afraid of kids falling out the windows. See, she was along. And uh, so we had to rent a place. And Bernie and I stayed in that place, and then they transferred us to Pass a Grill Hotel, I think it was. And uh, we were there, and that was a very nice spot. And then we rented a place there, and uh, that's where the <coughs> beach was just beautiful. And that's where the pictures are the that we see. Bernie and her sassy outfits. Yeah. And then you went to Harvard? Then I was grounded permanently. And uh, and sent to Harvard Statistical School. And what was the that you did there? I learned statistics. <laughs> so you were there for what, about three months? About three months. <coughs> We're on. All right, so you're, you're in statistics in Boston for three months, and then you go to where? I think I was transferred to El Paso. To El Paso for, for about a week. For about a week. Bigsfield. And then from Bigsfield to Topeka. No, to Tucson. Tucson, yeah. And you're back at Davis Mountain. Davis Mountain Field. And you're doing what kind of work there? I was doing personnel and statistics. What kind of statistics? Oh God, there are all kinds of statistics. With all these people that are moving people around all over, truck drivers and, and uh, mechanics and all, all cooks, cooks everybody. So was all there? All personnel. Everybody had a military uh, occupational specialty number. Each one had a number. Each category had a number. And move them around. Maybe they were short of cooks in Nebraska. Maybe they were short of uh, truck drivers up in Rapid City, South Dakota. So, so you were in what uh, Air Force at that time? I was in the 2nd Air Force. So you had transferred from the 13th Air Force to the 2nd Air Force. Right. And uh, you were in personnel down there in davis Monthan and and uh, then ultimately were transferred to where? To Colorado Springs, to headquarters Colorado Springs. That was headquarters for 2nd Air Force? 2nd Air Force. Yeah. And uh, was it there that you uh, became a captain? Yes. At Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. Where was it that you were stationed then at the time you were done? I was let out of, of Colorado Springs. And was Bernie then, was she with you this whole time? She was with us, and John was born in Colorado Springs. Okay. He was born in Colorado. D-Day. Down where for V-E-Day and E-J-Day? Colorado Springs. 
So John was born in March of 45. March of 45. And let's see, you were, yeah, that's right, you were back, you were back uh, by, well, what did we say? You were back in San Francisco by January of 44. So, yeah. Late January of 44. So then, you're out in November of 45. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to get out? Well, I had an opportunity to go to Europe with UNRWA, that's the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation, because I did have a superior rating, which was top rating in the service. But your mother wanted, she had two kids, and she wanted to get out of Army Air Force life. And so that is why I, tr I turned that down. And we went back to Ellsworth, and I went back and got my old job back. What do you mean by superior rating? Well, there, there are ratings in the service. Like, uh, I can't remember. It's like being uh, an A student, or a B student, or a C student, or something like that. And there are very few superior ratings. How did you get a superior rating? Because of my ability. Oh, well, there you go. All right. Now, do you really think you had fatigue? Damn right. I mean, I mean, when you were in Miami, or had you just decided that you were? No, no, it? Jesus, you know, it was just, and I really, uh, you're just so damn nervous, and and not only that, but I really pined over Dowie's death bothered the hell out of me that he died. Okay. Well, <coughs> and then, so you're out of the service in November of 45 and you come back to Minnesota. That was about four years in the service. About four years. Yeah, well that was a long time, long enough I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, did they try to get you to stay in? They wanted me to stay in for, for that UNRWA. But I turned them down because of your mother wanting to start life yeah. in the public zone or whatever. Yeah. Where, did you, 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 where did you get your medals? Wasn't that in Florida? Yeah, I got my uh, distinguished, oh, you forgot about the distinguished flying cross. Okay, you got a distinguished flying cross and some clusters. Are you still on here? Yeah. Yeah, when I was in, at Pass a Grill, I was the only one who had, they had a big parade, and I didn't want to do it, because I was the only one, and they had, they pinned a distinguished service, distinguished flying cross on me, and they even had the nurses out, and they had uh, everybody in the band playing and all that crap, and I just felt, I don't deserve this thing. What was it, how does that classify in terms of where the medals are? Well, that is, there aren't too many get the DFC. We got it for the first 25 missions. And a lot of people didn't survive 25 missions. And it wasn't for being any sort of extra heroic, it was just that we lasted that long. <laughs> okay. So, any, but anyway, uh, they even have a DFC society. Uh, a lot of people get air medals and that sort of thing, you know, but there aren't too many get the DFC. Okay, well that's going to do it. Thanks for your time, and now we've got this down for Posterity. And generations to come. And okay, that's the end of it. See ya. Unless there's anything else you want to say to the to the those down the pike. You see where you washed out in Fort McCoy, Wisconsin? Our service? Well, I, I didn't wash out. That's where I was right. let out of the service. Oh, you came up to Fort McCoy and they discharged that's, you there? They discharged me at Fort McCoy. Discharge. Which doesn't amount to much. Everybody has to get discharged someplace. Okay.
All right. Okay. Bye. Adios.